Hello again and welcome to how to incorporate rain gardens into your next WaterWise landscape project. This is the second of a three-part stormwater education training series, um, so thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'd like to draw your attention to, um, to this slide in that this is um, a bilingual presentation, and so you need to choose a room to be in. Um, so please choose your preferred language on the toolbar. It looks like a globe um, at the bottom of your screen and then select mute original audio. Um, also, we have closed captions for this webinar. To turn off this setting, select live transcript at the bottom of your screen and select hide subtitle. So even if you are in the English um, section, you do need to select English, otherwise you will not be able to hear the whole presentation. And now I'm uh, very glad to turn it over to Frank Kinder. Thank you, Frank. Hello, everybody. My name is here. I'm a water efficiency manager for Northern Water. We are that's and we uh, thirty-two. We cannot hear him at all, Jessica. Okay, Frank. Um, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, so maybe you can log back on. Okay, everyone. So while Frank is coming back on, um, when he rejoins us, um, we'll have him do his um, introduction once again. Let's see, hold on just one second. Thank you for all for your patience Sorry with about that. COVID. Hi, Frank. Hi there, I apologize. I'm having some internet issues. Um, this is just a chance for us to partner with CSU to share this technical information. And in the virtual format, we can do that safely. We're providing it in two languages for ultimate accessibility, and the recordings will be uh, shared later on in both languages as well. So uh, we would look to these types of solutions to encourage folks to incorporate landscape design and management that includes precipitation, and rain gardens are a great solution to do so. And uh, like this and other formats across the region for municipal allottees that we serve as well as other cities, the private sector, public sector, and elsewhere. So Frank, we can't hear you again. Apologies, everyone. Thank you again for your patience. So Northern Water um, is in Northern Colorado and we um, provide uh, water to 33 different cities, 29 districts and six industrial water users. Um, and this is a map that shows our uh, coverage and our system. I don't, so within water efficiency, we have several different programs. We have uh, the conservation gardens, consultations and audits, fact sheets and tools, grants, partners and resources, planning and efficiency, training and events, and water wise landscapes. And then we also have a, a weather network that has 23 weather stations in our boundaries. Thank you. Um, Northern Water will be hosting uh, in-person ALCC Sustainable Landscape Management uh, training in November. So keep an eye out for it and register. We are discounting it to provide opportunity to support uh, the industry. So uh, get more information uh, at ALCC. And um, soon coming is a Colorado Water Loss um, Initiative. Uh, we've been working with CWCB to get this marketed and moving forward. And so this is another opportunity to um, participate in some additional education. 
the Sonoran Institute we have um, supported in the last few years. They are great for mu municipalities and um, support the integration of um, land and water use. Uh, that I believe, look, look there, it's coming in 2022, fall of 2022. And Jessica Thrasher is our wonderful instructor today. Um, she is with the Colorado Stormwater Center. And um, I will let you provide a little bit more information, Jessica. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for stepping in from Northern Water. Um, I would have everyone give her a big round of applause if we were in person, but we very much appreciate her stepping in with the technical difficulties. Uh, Frank, did you wanna add anything else? No? Okay. Um, so I will get started today. Um, again, thank you all so much for joining us for our webinar today on how to incorporate rain gardens into your next WaterWise landscape project. As Lindsay mentioned, I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the Colorado Stormwater Center at Colorado State University. And this is a beautiful picture of a rain garden at New Belgium Brewing Company and, of course, what we'll be talking about today. In case this is your first um, class with us, I wanted to give you a little bit more information. Sorry, wrong slide. Um, that one wasn't translated on the Colorado Stormwater Center. So our mission is to advance stormwater management throughout Colorado by conducting practical research and providing education and training opportunities like this. Um, we also have been in partnership, as I've mentioned with Northern Water, we're doing those three different series and the next one is on extended detention basins. In addition to our trainings, we also have several upcoming certifications, September 30th and November 9th, We'll be doing um, stormwater control measure inspection and maintenance certification and stormwater control measure design design review all pending any COVID uh, restrictions. In addition to our education, we also do a great deal of research and um, throughout this training you'll see a lot of blue links. All of these links um, you'll receive this PowerPoint after the training and those will be direct links to take you um, to each of these uh, websites. And the last thing, we just completed our 2021 Colorado Stormwater Symposium. Um, it was a great day. We had um, the, the first session was on the impacts of fire on water quality. Um, and then we had green infrastructure in action examples. And lastly was stormwater education and training opportunities. All of those recordings will be available on the website soon. So today uh, we're going to be starting off with our stormwater challenges. Why are we having this discussion in the first place? Then we'll be talking about um, the specifics of what a rain garden actually is, um, the benefits and limitations of using and installing them, some different design considerations. So I won't be going into detail about how exactly to design a rain garden. Um, that is really dependent on your site and what type of rain garden you are installing. But I'm going to be talking about some general considerations. If you're interested in learning more about how to exactly design a rain garden, then I would refer you to our design and design review course. And then talking about maintenance. Maintenance is such a critical component of green infrastructure in general, um, really any, in it, any infrastructure. And so I'll be going over how to maintain your rain garden for success, um, how to install one, and then we have so many rain garden examples. Um, I think as we're looking at what this technology can bring us, it's great to see them in action. And then finally, I always include a lot of additional resources. So to start off with, what are our stormwater challenges? Um, urbanization, as we urbanize, we have um, less green space, we have decreased infiltration and a huge increase in stormwater runoff. And that has happened as our cities have grown um, and we see this issue um, exponentially increasing our stormwater challenges as we continue to grow. So this is what this looks like. Um, when we have natural ground cover, and you can see kind of from these four different boxes, 
the difference between natural ground cover and then what happens when you have 75 to 100% impervious surface. And I'll just touch on a couple of these briefly. So with the top left, with your natural ground cover, you have 25% deep infiltration and 25% shallow infiltration. But then as you get down to the bottom right box of 75% to 100% impervious surfaces, and this is what we're seeing, you know, of course, in large cities. Um, oh, and then, sorry, one more thing about the top box is it's 10% runoff. So it's a very low runoff rate, and that runoff is also getting absorbed by that vegetation. But when we're down at the bottom box, you have 5% deep infiltration and 10% shallow infiltration with 55% runoff. And so what does that look like? Why does that matter? It matters because as the rent, as the runoff, you know, hits our impervious surfaces, goes from um, some roof lines down to sidewalks, down to roadways, it's picking up pet waste, fertilizers, motor oil, trash, debris, um, chemicals and detergents, and that's all putting it into our waterways. In addition, um, climate change is causing a lot of difficulties with our water. We have drought impacting our stormwater and our water availability, and of course, wildfire. Um, wildfire has some astronomical impacts to our water quality. Um, it's it's causing um, lack of infiltration because that soil has been burned. And so um, at a high level of heat and in the presentations that we just had for our stormwater symposium, they're really looking at the difference between extremely high fire or hot fires and then less, you know, less heat. And it was very interesting to see what happens to the soil. So you have less infiltration, you have a lot of sediment running off causing water quality issues um, and issues also for our water providers like Northern Water. Uh, Northern Water was talking about the impacts um, to their infrastructure. Additionally, um, we have flooding. So as we have that increase in, um, in removal of green space, um, we also have, and with fires as well, we have increased runoff. And so we have um, catastrophic flooding, as you've seen here, and as we saw earlier in the year from the Poudre Canyon. But we also have a nuisance flooding events where if you're trying to have a city that is walkable, your sidewalks are um, continually flooded and so you're not able to have that walkable city. Um, it's causing more um, dangerous driving conditions, potentially flooding basements. Um, so these are all the impacts that we see with increased stormwater. And as you get increases in stormwater, um, what happens when stormwater runs across vegetation is that it sinks into the ground and the pollutants that were in that stormwater are now being trapped in that vegetation and that soil layer. So the water that goes all the way through to the groundwater is cleaner. Well, if you, when you have channel instability and erosion, what happens is as water is moving at a fast pace across the landscape, it creates these channels. And then it cuts through that soil profile where all of those contaminants are being locked and it releases them back into our waterways. So this is causing increased sedimentation and water pollution, so impacting our water quality. Um, and what happens when we have though that fertilizer and debris and trash um, going into our waterways, we get algal blooms, which can cause hazards to human, pet and aquatic health. And finally, um, just want to make this very important note, we have these extremes in climate events, um, when we have extreme drought, when we have floods, the populations that tend to be impacted the most are our vulnerable populations. And so equity is a really big component of green infrastructure and how we um, build moving forward to make sure that all of our community members are receiving um, adequate um, access to um, and protection from these stormwater challenges and also um, that they can benefit from these green infrastructure practices. Okay, so what does stormwater management look like now? Um, I guess in the past, the way that we have viewed stormwater is really as a nuisance, as a waste product, something that needs to be removed from the property as quickly as possible. And this was done, you know, with good intention to prevent that flooding issue. Um, but what that has caused is really 
as, we, as you have fast moving water moving across a landscape, you get that debris. And as you see from this picture, you get that soil across sidewalks and things like that. And what's that, what that's translated to as far as gray infrastructure goes is we have the rain hitting a roof, going into a downspout, hitting our sidewalk and parking lot, going into our uh, gir, uh, curb and gutter system, and then um, I'm sure you've all seen these drains that say they go straight to the river um, and then they go into our rivers. So that is what gray infrastructure looks like. Um, it's all concrete or impervious surfaces um, that are being used to move stormwater in addition to our piping systems to move stormwater out into our rivers. The most common type of stormwater infrastructure in Colorado is called an extended detention basin. Um, and that uses the process of sedimentation where water is held for approximately 40 hours to allow pollutants to settle to the bottom of the basin. That is our next um, class. So if you're interested in learning more about that, which um, I highly encourage you to sign up for our next um, presentation in October. Okay, so what is a rain garden? Um, to start off with, it is a type of low impact development. So apologies for the busy slide, um, but it's important to really focus in on um, this impact, this part of the terminology. So low impact development is an approach to land development or redevelopment that works with nature to manage stormwater as close to the source as possible. So now we're talking about preserving and recreating natural landscape features decreasing our impervious surfaces and treating stormwater as a resource rather than a waste product, which is how it has been treated in the past. Um, another term you've probably heard a lot or interchangeably with low impact development or LID is green infrastructure. And green infrastructure is defined um, as referring to the systems and practices that use or mimic natural processes to infiltrate evapotranspirate and reuse stormwater runoff where it is generated. So a rain garden is a type of green infrastructure and it's also a type of low impact development. Green infrastructure really is looking at a multifaceted approach of having benefits to the environment, economic benefits, as well as improving the quality of life of our community, because we're having more natural processes, more green space available to our communities. And throughout COVID, we've really seen the importance of instituting more green space um, for the mental health um, and our actual health uh, for our community members. In addition, the rain, rain gardens are also a part of the one water approach, which is looking at the mindset that all water is, has value. Again, looking at that multiple benefits, um, what's the best water for the best use and looking at the mindset that water has value. Um, the right size solutions for managing storm water potentially, um, giving the same weight to having thriving cities, and social and economic inclusion, as well as healthy waterways. So I'm sure you've also heard the term one water. So just connecting that, that rain gardens are also a component of the one water approach. These are other types of green infrastructure and low impact development. We're not going to be talking about them today, um, but the recording from our green infrastructure um, stormwater series, that was the first one of the series um, in August, that will be available in the next few weeks on the Northern Water and Colorado Stormwater Center website. Um, I also like to talk about the difference between Xeriscape and a rain garden, um, because I think it's important to make sure that people understand that distinction. Xeriscape um, has low water or non-native plants or native plants. Um, Xeriscape is really focused on improving the soil, having efficient irrigation, um, limiting turf, having the appropriate plants for the appropriate space, um, mulching. And then um, it is at times planted on a slope or on mounts. So you can kind of see that from the left-hand picture. That's not always the case, of course, um, but that is the case in some spots. Uh, for some really great examples of Xeriscape, Northern Waters Conservation Gardens are a wonderful place to look for that. Um, a rain garden 
also Después has los jardines de lluvia. Um, do you have a question, Teresa? Um, no. Okay, I could just I could just hear you. Sorry. <laughs> um, so then, for a rain garden, it utilizes rainwater. So as you can see from this photo. And we'll look at this again in just a moment, but um, you're directing the rain into a depression. Um, you're using native plants. Rain gardens also improve the soil, but they do not need additional irrigation once they are established um, because you're, you're using native plants that are adapted to our climate. Um, you also use mulch in a rain garden. Mulch is very critical to the success of a rain garden. So there are some similar features, but they are distinctly different. Um, rain gardens are also a principle of rainwater harvesting. Um, and so some of these principles, just very quickly, these are by uh, Brad Lancaster in his book, Rainwater Harvesting for the Drylands and Beyond. He is an expert, has been doing a lot of work in rainwater harvesting in the um, Arizona area. So the principles of rainwater harvesting are start at the top of your watershed. It's really hard to make changes and move a lot of water once it's on the low side or the bottom of your watershed. We're trying to slow water down, spread it out, and sink it into the ground or infiltrate it. And then looking at the multiple paved or um, surfaces that are hardscapes, ways that you could harvest more of the rain or infiltrate more of that rain. It's working to protect water quality and then reduce the amount of stormwater runoff we have going into our streets. There are two main types of rainwater harvesting. One are active systems, which collect and store water for future use. An example of this would be rain barrels. Um, this cannot be used in the commercial setting um, without specific, um, like Denver Water has done this, but um, that's part of a um, demonstration area. So you have to get special permissions to do that. But on a residential scale, you can, you can collect rainwater. Um, and then the other type, which we'll be talking about today is passive systems, um, which is a rain garden, but this uses gravity to direct and slow that flow of water. This allows for greater infiltration and passive systems can collect a substantially greater amount of water than um, passive, than active systems rather. Um, so a rain garden, I'll be moving back and forth today between a commercial um, setting and what's being used uh, when you're using rain gardens for um, a stormwater control measure and kind of that um, HOA to landscaper to residential homes. There are different um, best practices and regulations for kind of each one. And so um, if that gets confusing, you can always put a question in the chat or just unmute to ask me your question. But since we have a variety of um, participants today from different areas, I wanted to be sure to touch on the different aspects so that um, all of you could really take something away from today's um, lecture. So um, rain gardens are um, a depression and that's being used to slow and capture and infiltrate the stormwater runoff. Another term that you might be hearing is bioretention, and that is the type of treatment process, uh, while rains gardens are the best management practice. Here is another view of that rain garden where the water is directed into this depression. The depression is called a basin, um, and it's basically a hole, a depression. So water is directed into this basin. This is not a pond. Um, rain gardens are legal in Colorado. You're just slowing the water down. You're not stopping it because it's infiltrating into the soil. Um, so you have your basin and then you have your berm on the, on the downhill side, which is a buildup of soil. And it's really just to hold that water um, so that it can infiltrate into the soil. Then we have native plants. Um, because again, they are adapted to our climate. They're adapted to those periods of drought and of, um, of a lot of rain. And then mulch. Mulch acts as this super absorbent layer. It helps to um, insulate the soil and prevent the plants from getting too dried out. And it also helps um, prevent some weeds. 
So now you may be thinking, okay, well, why are we talking about rain gardens in Colorado? It doesn't rain that much here. But actually, um, in the Fort Collins area, we typically get about 16 inches of rain per year, which doesn't sound like a lot of rain, but a one inch rain on a 1000 square foot roof, which is really a section of roof, even on residential properties, will yield 600 gallons of water or 9,600 gallons of water per year. So we have plenty of rain to make very effective rain gardens here. Uh, rain gardens are being utilized extremely successfully in Arizona where they get a much less rain than we do, um, somewhere around the 11 inches per year. Now there are, we're getting a little bit technical here, so bear with me. Um, just wanted to show you the different types of infiltration um, that we're talking about with a stormwater control measure. So um, a rain garden is exactly what we're still talking about here. This is looking at how that process works. How does it clean the water? Um, so the first type of filtration is no infiltration. So you can have rain gardens, and this is if your MS4 permit is requiring you to treat your water quality. Um, and so the no infiltration design is if it's next to a building potentially, but this is the different components of it. What happens with the rain garden is the rain enters the depression and then it's forced to, the water is then forced downward um, through a filtration media. Again, this is if it's the MS4 treated. Um, then it goes down in this case into an under drain and then that cleaned water goes into our storm drain. And you can see that evapotranspiration is also a part of that process. Um, the next type of stormwater of filtration is partial infiltration. So I know these look very similar, but this one has infiltration and an under drain, but no liner so that um, water can go through, but just in case the water is not um, moving through that filter material in fast enough time to drain, these typically drain in about 12 hours, um, then you have that under drain to move water more quickly into your storm drain. In Colorado, we mostly use partial infiltration because of our soils that are really clayey. Um, and so that would stop the water from moving all the way through at a faster rate. And so that's why we utilize this method. And finally, the full infiltration method, there's no under drain, there's no liner, um, and the water is just moving all the way through. The different components of a rain garden, um, you have an inlet, um, you have a four bay, which is optional. Um, this is really, again, what you're seeing more on the, um, in the situations where a rain garden is being used as a stormwater control measure um, for a municipality or an MS4 permit. The filter media, um, your landscape and your vegetation, of course, you need those plants in there. And then an overflow structure, what happens when your rain garden fills up? Um, where does that extra water go? and then an under drain, which you may or may not have. Um, so let's talk about inlets. What is the purpose of an inlet? An inlet allows the stormwater to enter into your rain garden. It's also looking to dissipate energy. So as you have a lot of water coming in, you want to be sure that you have that energy dissipation so that you're not getting erosion happening. So we're trying to slow the water down as it enters into the rain garden so that it can flow through the rain garden without causing any erosion. You can have um, a couple of different types of inlets. One is a concentrated inlet where you have one entry point for the water or a distributed inlet where you have multiple entry points. And here's some examples of what that looks like. So on the left-hand side, um, that is showing you that you have that, um, that one entry point, this rain garden is on um, is in Fort Collins and it's along a roadway. And so you have that one entry point as it fills up that rain garden and then once it's full, the water continues um, down the street. And then the next concentrated inlet, um, this is called a two step or two inch drop where the water is coming in. Um, this is also off of a street. And then um, next you have a distributed inlet. Um, and so you can see this, how 
this curve has multiple cuts in it. And so the water is really coming in at multiple points. And this is helping the water um, to really flow in more evenly through these larger rain gardens. And finally, this distributed inlet, um, I'll show you another picture of this later, but this is a place in Denver where the water is coming in and then um, flowing across that rain garden. Um, it's really mimicking the natural process of a water coming in, you know, through different points into a depression. So either one, you might see either one as you look at rain gardens in your area. Okay, now a four bay, you know, this really depends. Again, you may or may not have it. Here is a closer look at that um, distributed inlet that we were looking at before. This is in Denver. Um, and what they did here was pretty unique. A really great idea. So they utilized this parking um, as their four bay. So a four bay is really designed to um, to stop trash, large debris, large trash um, from going into your rain garden. So what they've done is they've created this parking space and the holes are smaller so that the water will slow down a little bit and then progress through these holes. And then the bigger, like the leaves and the trash and debris will stay in this kind of parking lot four bay area. They also have monthly street sweeping. So part of their um, maintenance process is just what they normally do to maintain their streets. Um, so this was really a no cost maintenance um, opportunity for those folks in Denver to maintain their rain garden very easily. Um, another example of a four bay here on the left is, is from the city of Fort Collins. Um, and this look definitely looks different than the one I just showed you on the right here in Denver. And what, what happened here is there was a study done with the Colorado Stormwater Center and with the city of Fort Collins to see about how much better the water quality would be if pea gravel was put into this four bay um, of this rain garden. And so what they determined from all this testing is that pea gravel actually did um, help the water quality. The water was cleaner coming out of that rain garden. But as you can see on the far right, it was just too hard to maintain. In order to maintain it, you had to use a vacuum truck and suck out all the pea gravel um, and then replace it more frequently than you would want. So there was a big expense there. So again, uh, you might see a four bay. And so as you're going around looking um, at rain gardens after this class and you see some, now you know what that component is. And if you're looking to install them, um, this might be a component you might need to consider. Next is filter media. Um, the filter media removes the pollutants before the runoff infiltrates into the groundwater or goes into the underdrain. Um, the filter media will eventually clog because the whole point of the filter media is to collect those pollutants. And so you want it to be removing them and therefore becoming kind of clogged. And so it won't let water to pass through it eventually um, if it's not maintained properly. And so we'll be talking about how to maintain that. But those, as from this picture, you can see those pollutants are starting to accumulate. And just so you know, that means it's working. Here is kind of what filter media should look like and shouldn't look like. Um, from the picture on the left, this is of course what it should not look like. Um, we'll be talking about ways that uh, rain gardens are installed improperly, which is hap what happened here. But as you can see from this, the filter media is clogged right in the center because that it was um, installed at a slope. And so all of the water is being concentrated in the very center. The plants are not receiving adequate water. Um, and then you also can contrast that to the photo on the right where you have this beautiful lush vegetation. Um, when you have vegetation that looks like that, you almost certainly have filter material um, that is functioning because that means that water is getting to um, all of the vegetation and making it look like that. And also you have deep roots and as the roots um, go deeper, you're also increasing that infiltration. Um, so I was kind of moving back and forth between saying filter media, what that really is, is your soil. If you are from a municipality and you're using this as a water um, quality or a stormwater control measure, you have to use a specific type of media. If you are not, if you're installing this at your HOA, at your residence, at a commercial building um, where it does not fall into that category, 
Um, you don't have to use a special media, but you do need to know what kind of soil that you have because it helps you know what to expect from your rain garden. Um, you need to know what type of infiltration you're getting at your site. Um, rain gardens will build up and improve your soil, but before you install your rain garden, you may need to add in some type of soil amendments based on your soil type. Um, and so after this, at the very end, I do have some resources on um, how to do your infiltration test. How do you know um, how that's how to work? How do you know what soil amendments to use? Um, so in answering if you have any of those types of questions. Benefits of rain gardens. Um, we've talked about how they increase water quality and remove pollutants. They also recharge our groundwater. So instead of water going down a steep slope and running into our um, drains, our storm drains, and then into our rivers immediately, where it's really spiking our hydrograph, um, we're having water sit slowly. Um, it's mimicking that natural process. And then it's going into our groundwater where it is being recharging that groundwater. Um, rain gardens, in use, when utilized in cities, also decrease heat island effects. Um, so by having all of that concrete, it's radiating that heat back up. But as you increase the amount of vegetation in cities, it decreases that heat island effect, which means that cities are hotter than their surrounding areas. Um, Increasing wildlife habitat. Now this has been a really neat change to see at my own house where I have installed several rain gardens. Um, we have had such a substantial increase in wildlife since I have installed these because of the native plants. We've had hummingbirds for the first time in our yard. Um, we've had deer, we've had a lot of different pollinators and have uh, just created this really beneficial habitat. Um, for as habitat corridor. And as you are building more rain gardens and increasing more native plants, um, this is something that you can do that benefits wildlife. Um, it's helping to manage stormwater and looking at it as a resource instead of a waste product. It helps with public education. So if you're utilizing rain gardens um, as a part of your stormwater management strategies, this is also an opportunity to educate the public on the benefits of rain gardens and how we're um, utilizing stormwater as that resource. Um, also decreasing the demand for irrigation. This is a conservation, a water conservation strategy um, by combining stormwater treatment, by combining water quality with your landscape requirements, you're having this dual benefit. Um, and then finally, increasing access to nature, which we know is so important. Um, just one second, we're having technical difficulties once again, just one moment. Okay, um, next is some limitations of rain gardens. One, as I was mentioning before, is incorrect construction. And the way that these are um, incorrectly constructed is that they're being installed like a typical landscape feature where you have um, the, the soil and the mulch and that, um, that landscape material being put in kind of a bowl format but not in the way that it's supposed to be. Um, it is being created so that there really isn't an opportunity for the water to go all the way through. So as I mentioned before, you are creating this depression. You are creating this bowl-like structure, but the bottom has to be flat. Where you're putting your plants, you want to have an opportunity for that water to spread out, especially when you're using this where you're trying to purify the water um, for that purpose, like in a stormwater requirement for your MS4. Um, in those cases, that water that you're having is much more highly polluted than it would be in other situations. So if this, if this was connected to a parking lot, which I believe it is, then that's why you're having this really big increase in the amount of pollutants. So what you want to see from these types of, um, of rain gardens is really a flat bottom so that that water can spread out evenly across, across that filter material and then um, go through it um, so that those pollutants can be more distributed and also water those plants that you have planted evenly. 
Um, you can have this sediment buildup, as you can see here, and then this hasn't been properly installed or maintained. So in this case, that sediment area needs to be raked out um, and so, so that it can properly infiltrate because this has gotten to a point where no water can um, enter it at all. And then at the bottom here, where you see that bottom arrow at the bottom of this picture, water can't even really get in here anymore because um, the landscape material plus all of the pollutants and debris have started to block that entry point where water enters into this rain garden. Um, considerations, you will need to establish your vegetation. Um, so that means you will need to water them, um, but you don't want to install permanent um, irrigation in rain gardens, um, but until they are um, established, what takes two to three years, you will need to water them. So this would be an instance of temporary irrigation. Uh, once again, you might need an under drain depending on your site and this, and you might have to add or remove plants. Um, depending on, again, kind of bouncing around here, in the commercial setting, if you have a roadway rain garden, then it's getting a lot more salts from, from snow, from um, whatever is put on roadways, um, uh, the uh, de-icer from roadways is getting into these rain gardens. And so the plants that you selected might not hold up well in those situations, but would hold up really well if, if you had a rain garden that was not on connected to a roadway. So um, if you're thinking of installing several different rain gardens in different locations, just know that they won't all work the same and that you might have to tweak um, the vegetation that you add in there depending on what pollutants you have coming in. Um, rain gardens can be either really small or huge. Um, there's really that kind of that whole scale that you can do. On the left here is this beautiful rain garden that was installed at the mall in Fort Collins. It is extremely large um, and it's functioning beautifully. This picture is from the spring um, of this year. We will see more pictures of that later. And then um, the picture on the right is one of my home rain gardens. Um, so when talking about rain gardens, this isn't something that just municipalities can do. Um, anyone can install them. Um, it's an effective stormwater control measure no matter what. Um, you're also saving water um, at the residential scale or on the commercial scale. Rain gardens can be installed in a number of different locations. Um, on the far left here, you see that it's connected. Um, this is in Fort Collins again but it's connected um, to a parking lot and road. Um, so it's receiving that road runoff um, and the parking lot runoff. This is actually combined um, potentially with um, permeable pavement. Um, and so you have two different green infrastructure strategies here. Um, and then the middle one, that's right off of a roadway, um, as you can see. And so that's, instead of it being bumped out, like we saw in a previous picture, this is more um, inside. Um, next to the sidewalk. And so that's converting, instead of having grass there, you're utilizing that with native plants and also reducing the amount of stormwater runoff that you have going um, down your street. And then the final one is um, not off of a street, that's utilizing uh, runoff from a commercial building. This is actually off of the um, city of Fort Collins main building um, that they have directed all of their commercial building stormwater runoff into this uh, rain garden. If you are um, using this for like your HOA, a residential site, um, even a smaller commercial site, um, you need to think about removing if there's turf there. So I just wanted to point you to a couple of resources. A lot of municipalities have resources for turf removal. Also Resource Central has a turf removal program. Um, if you're in the city of Fort Collins, they have a program as well. And then here are a couple of places where you could get rid of your sod or um, find a way to cut it or remove it. Um, next, you need to get the water to your rain garden. Um, and how do you do that? There's a couple of different ways that you can do that. Um, one is just by directing your downspout um, and your gutter to the rain garden as seen from uh, my house uh, or my chicken coop rather um, into the rain garden there. The next um, picture over is looking at a downspout extender. Um, and so 
where we wanted to place the rain garden was a little bit farther from the downspout. And so you can just use a downspout extender to get that water there. And then you can also see that erosion control that's happening with those river rocks. Another strategy is to um, have this underground pipe with an outlet um, so that you don't have um, that downspout extender on top of, of your um, lawn area or your um, yard area. And so that can just go underground and then it has the outlet in the rain garden if it's farther away from your structure. Or in this case this is another look at that rain garden from the city of Fort Collins building. And they have this cobble swale, um, which is directing all of the water into the rain garden. So they have their, um, where the arrow is, a little bit higher up from the arrow, they have their downspout going there. And then they have just this sloped area with rock so that it's not really infiltrating very much into that spot. Then it's just going and directing it into the rain garden. So these are some different strategies and ways that you can move water um, to get it to where you want it to go. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for questions. You can either unmute yourself or you can add any questions that you had in the chat and I can answer those for you. <clears throat> and I can also answer any questions that you have. Um, if you think of something after our question breaks, we do have several question breaks built in, but I'm always happy to stop and answer questions. Um, as they come in. So if you think of something, you can go ahead and put it in the chat and I will address it. Okay, here are a couple of design um, considerations. <clears throat> One, I know this won't um, be relevant to everyone depending on um, you know, what type of rain gardens you were installing, but it's such an important point. I wanted to put it in here to remind everyone to please locate your utility lines before you do any digging. If you are a homeowner, there is a free service. Um, they do locate to the meter, um, or you might need to hire another company to locate some utilities um, in other areas that are past your meter. Um, but Obviously, if you're doing a large rain garden, this would be a part of your process, but just really wanted to highlight the importance of knowing where your utility lines are. When you're looking to select where your location of your rain garden should go, there are some different considerations. Um, one is you can walk around your building or your home and locate all of your downspouts. Um, if it's a commercial building, then you can also use runoff from parking lots or driveways or roads or other impervious surfaces um, and look at your potential rain garden sites. When you're looking to determine your site, um, ask yourself, if I select this spot, will the water drain away from my structure? Is there a slope? Um, can I dig here? Are there utilities here? Are there irrigation systems here? Is there a septic system? I know that's not relevant in all cases. Um, or a leach field? Are there other obstacles to digging there? Um, is it too close to structures? Um, they're supposed to, rain gardens are supposed to be 10 feet away from buildings. If this is a commercial setting, you could utilize a no infiltration rain garden with an under drain. If you want to put, put a rain garden closer to a building, that is one way um, that you could do it. Um, and that's something to um, speak to about the engineer or the designer that you're working with, if that is the case. Another consideration is um, how much rain will drain here? What is the catchment area of the site that you have selected? And how could I reduce the irrigation that I'm doing to this location if I were to install a rain garden? Also think about is um, observation is such a critical component of this process. Do you have water ponding in a certain area? Do you have um, some, some water that you just, you don't want it to pond there and it's a continual issue. Um, so this is actually my driveway before I did um, my renovations to my landscape. And that is not where I wanted the water to go. So as I kind of spoke to earlier, this is the bottom of my watershed. So in order for me not to have these situations occur with this pool of water at the bottom of my watershed, I needed to make changes at the top of my watershed, which is what I did. 
So if you're thinking instead of this waste product or this nuisance water, how do I get rid of it as quickly as possible? Think about how could this water be used as a resource? And um, by utilizing a rain garden, you could alleviate some drainage issues potentially. Um, when you are choosing a location, um, looking at the amount of water you can collect from that downspout or roof line. I just like this picture, honestly, of these downspouts. It just looks really cool. Um, what a really neat way to celebrate the rain as it comes down a downspout. Um, and so I just wanted to put that there for you. But downspouts are really one spot that you can start by trying to figure out where can you put a rain garden. Um, when you're doing prepping of your site, um, compost may be needed. What you cannot do is just use um, topsoil for rain gardens. If you are um, using a rain garden as your MS4 um, for a um, stormwater control measure, you need to use that special mix once again. But if you're not, um, then you need to be sure that um, some soil amendments might be needed. You might need to be um, using some compost. And, but just keep kind of reminding yourself too that you don't need to over amend. You don't need to dig out that your basin, remove all of that native soil and put in potting soil. We're not removing the native soil. We just need to amend it to have better infiltration. Um, and native plants need native soils. You can do a soils test um, through CSU or there are some other strategies for finding what kind of soil you may have. Um, if you are doing some soil amendments, um, best practice is to mix um, eight to 12 inches of the amendment into the soil. Um, finally, what happens when your rain garden fills up? Where does that extra water go? Um, what do you do? So there are a couple of different overflow options um, from the rain garden that I showed you uh, from the city of Fort Collins or not in the city, in the city at the mall. This is their overflow structure. So the far left picture is an overflow structure. This type of rain garden is being used to treat water quality. And so those are specific components that you have as a part of that. Um, so this type, this basin will fill up completely. And if it overtops, if it fills up past its capacity, it goes down through the top of this great tier, which is their overflow system. In your next picture, the second one from the left, if that rain garden fills up um, from the, on this street, it just, the water simply continues on the street and passes the rain garden by. So if it has the ability to collect more water, water will go into that uh, curb cut. And if it's full, it will pass straight through. In looking at the rain garden from my house, the overflow, uh, once it's filled up, is actually over some rocks. It's stabilized right there, um, but still it's not going towards a structure. Um, there is a use, and I know where that overflow is going. Um, and the final picture is showing how um, these rain gardens were dug, but then they were connected together. So the overflow from one rain garden was then directed into a different rain garden. So there's multiple ways that you could do your overflow uh, for a rain garden. Um, just a note here on weed barrier, do not put weed barrier in rain gardens. Um, the whole point of a rain garden is to infiltrate. Um, a lot of weed barriers, they don't have um, they're not permeable. Some are, but you just, you just don't want, it's not best practice. You do not want weed barrier in rain gardens. Weed barriers are preventing um, the soil from amending, from um, improving. And then they also have um, weeds. As you can see, weed barriers don't prevent weeds. Um, the soil will just blow on top of it. Then weed seeds will blow on top of it. And then you get weeds Anyway, um, these pictures are really just showing how um, I did a, pro a small project at my house where I had a lot of weed barrier um, that was installed on our property um, and it was also sloped away from the trees. So if you can look at the second picture here, the water was coming from that top arrow down and then over this, um, this tree line where it had been elevated. So no water at any point is sitting and collecting and infiltrating around our trees, which was causing them to be sick. Um, also having weed barrier right up against a tree was also um, harming the root systems and making an unhealthy tree.
So I dug out a small basin. I created a berm um, to create um, more, you know, air around the around the tree and allow water to actually infiltrate when we had those larger rain events. Um, in Colorado, we tend to have usually um, really hard rains for a shorter period of time. And so if you're on a sloped area, by having these basins or opportunities to slow that water down and infiltrate it, that means we'll actually get water to, to stay around where we want it to stay instead of just running off really quickly down that sloped area. In addition, we tend to have clay soils. So that's also kind of reducing the ability of our soils to, to infiltrate when we get the type of rains that we usually do. Um, and then finally, if you're concerned by looking at these pictures that, well, I don't really want just huge holes in my landscape, the final picture, you can see what it looks like with mulch and it doesn't even look like there's anything there. Um, next to buildings, this is an example of how you can have it closer to a building by utilizing that liner and under drain. And it looks like a, it's a really great addition to the landscape feature there. Um, when you are looking at creating a rain garden with um, your aesthetic design, really try to create a feature and not just a facility. You know, how can you have this rain garden match the design characteristics from the surrounding area, utilizing any shapes that are natural shapes um, that complement or um, fix any kind of design issues that are surrounding it. Um, and then make it really um, similar type of texture um, to the surrounding area so that it doesn't, um, it really adds to your area rather than um, distracting or detracting from it. Uh, maintenance. So if you are on a residential property, you can use water from your rain barrel that you have to establish your plants. If you have a commercial property, of course you can't do that, but you will need to um, irrigate to establish those plants as a reminder. Um, the ways to do that, you wanna do deep watering um, really once per week, um, the first two to three months. In that first week, you need to probably be watering more shallow and daily, um, but once they're established, they'll only need supplemental water in very dry spells or periods of drought, um, and then if you have sediment, we'll be talking about that momentarily. And then it is a garden and you will have to weed it. Um, you cannot use um, um, herbicide in rain gardens because they are designed to clean the water. And so we don't wanna be adding any fertilizer um, or any, um, or any weed herbicide to our rain gardens because then you're adding pollutants into a system that is trying to clean that water. When you're designing your rain garden, really be sure to design for maintenance. You want to have a rain garden that's easy to maintain. If it's not easy to maintain, it won't be maintained properly. And then that's how we get bad examples of rain gardens or these systems failing. Um, and so if you need to give a very large rain garden, like the example I showed you at the mall, you need to have a way to get into that rain garden. How are you going to remove that sediment that has accumulated or rake um, in there? You know, do you need to have um, a wheelbarrow or will it be a larger piece of equipment that's very lightweight? Otherwise you'll compact um, that filter material and it won't absorb correctly. But you still need a way to get in there and maintain it without it being a, a huge hassle. Um, one of the ways <clears throat> that you need to maintain it potentially are replacing the top three to six inches um, for routine maintenance. And you can do this three times and remove those top three inches. Um, and this is in some cases, again, this won't be every single case of your rain gardens. And so you need to be sure um, to know what the maintenance, um, the frequency of maintenance is for your particular area. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these steps needed for rain gardens. Installation. Um, did you have a question, Teresa? No. No, you're good. Okay. Because you came through again. Um, so these are the steps needed for uh, rain garden installation. And this is what I use for my residential um, rain garden trainings. 
these, I just wanted to point out that at the end of my, uh, for the resources today, I will be um, linking you a video to my residential step-by-step -step installation if you're interested in learning more about um, how to do all of these, to do them at your home or at your HOA. Um, as far as vegetation goes, the function of your vegetation is to improve your infiltration rate, um, provide that aesthetic appeal, this vegetation also helps with the pollutant uptake. Um, it also reduces the, the amount of volume of water because it is um, infiltrating and so you're not having a large amount of runoff. Uh, once again, you need to irrigate it to establish, but don't put sprinkler heads in your rain garden. You really just want to use that temporary irrigation um, or you, know, you can water by hand or by a water truck or that temporary um, irrigation that will, can go automatically. But if you have to replace your filter material, you don't want um, sprinkler heads in your rain garden because then you'll have to replace your sprinkler systems if you need to, um, replace that filter material. Um, and so it's not facilitating maintenance, it's not making it easy to maintain, and you're just causing more problems and more expense by installing sprinkler heads in a rain garden. Vegetation also stabilizes your media, whether that is your soil and compost mix, whether it's your specific filter media, if you're using this as a stormwater control measure, it really just helps prevent that erosion. Okay, maintaining your rain garden for success. I'm going to go through the different steps that you need to do um, to maintain it properly. Um, for your inlets, um, your inlets and four bays, you want to go through and remove any sediment or debris with the proper equipment. This could be a shovel, it could be a vacuum truck. It could be um, a street sweeper, not just a street. <laughs> I left off street sweeper. Um, and so again, just when you're thinking of designing these, think about how they will be maintained and how easy it will be to go in there with your proper equipment. When you're going and inspecting your filter media, um, check for standing water or any sediment accumulation. You want to be sure that you have healthy vegetation, like in this picture, um, and keeping that media on the very bottom as flat as possible so that the water can spread out and that sediment can then be distributed across the larger area. You do not want to ever use your rain garden for snow storage. We'll be talking about that in more depth in just a moment. And then um, you'll need to be sure to check your filter media for the proper infiltration rate. Um, routine maintenance for your filter media would be raking or removing the top one to two inches of your filter material. Um, be sure to use lightweight equipment to prevent that compaction of that filter media um, because then that's really reducing the infiltration rate. Um, again, you can perform this manually as well. And then um, replace the top three to six inches after doing the routine maintenance three times. The non-routine maintenance for uh, rain gardens would be to remove or replace all of the filter media if it has been clogged. If you're doing your proper routine maintenance, this should not um, be required, but just so you know, that's what that, if you get to the point where your filter media is clogged, then that is what you would have to do is replace all of it. Snow storage. Okay, so if you have um, your rain garden next to a roadway, or you have it by a parking lot. What it looks like in the snow is this really nice flat spot to put snow. Um, and so this is a part of where signage is really critical, where you need to talk to your um, snow plow drivers and educate them on not putting snow there. What happens is the snow is extremely dirty, as you can see here, um, and full of pollutants. And then you are placing it, if you place it directly on a rain garden, first of all, it's going to hyper pollute the area that it's been in, it's um, being placed in. And so it's going to clog up your filter material. It's also heavy. And so it's going to be doing a lot of harm to your vegetation. 
um, and it potentially has de-icer or salts in it, which is also going to potentially kill the vegetation that you've worked really hard to establish or, um, or just really harm you know, you might have to do some replacement of vegetation um, after the season. So the best way to prevent having snow placed on your rain garden, if you have to place it close to it, then place it outside the inlet so that it can melt. And then that can be filtered appropriately through the filter material um, and then place that signage so that it's not being put directly on top of your rain garden. Um, we've talked about this um, a couple of times, but that media or mix um, depends. It really depends on your site, kind of what you need for success of your rain garden. Um, don't use only topsoil. There are some folks who use sod for rain gardens, um, but you cannot use clay grown sod. And really best practice is to use native plants anyway. But just that note, there is sand grown sod and there's clay grown sod. And you have to use sa sand grown sod for rain gardens, not clay grown sod. But again, it's actually better to just use native plants. Um, and then the specific filter media mix is required if it's a stormwater control measure, like I mentioned. One of the issues that you might see with rain gardens is displaced mulch. Um, and this can happen because you're using the incorrect mulch. Um, the, best the best type of mulch to use is shredded mulch because it holds together more um, versus a chipped mulch, which is very lightweight and can float easily. Um, so the it really is best though to use mulch versus using rock. Um, so even if you do have a very large rain event and you've used shredded mulch um, and it's still, mulch still kind of leaves your rain garden, just kind of sweep it back in. Um, but you shouldn't have that issue normally if you have used the correct mulch. Um, sometimes, you know, you might need to re-level or refill your rain garden with mulch um, using lightweight equipment if you um, have had several multiple uh, very large rain events in a row and it has done some displacement of your mulch. Okay, so how do you know if your rain garden is working properly? Um, there's a couple of different things that you can do to test the infiltration rate. This is you trying to determine if your rain garden is clogged. <clears throat> so um, one of the ways you can do that is visit your site within 24 hours of um, a half inch rain event. So you really don't wanna go before 24 hours, try to go right around that 24 hour mark um, because rain gardens are supposed to, um, to infiltrate that water within about 12 hours. Um, and so if you go out at 24 hours, um, and the water is still ponded, you still have water in there, then your media or your outlet may be clogged and you need to take action to remedy that. Um, if you do this once or twice per year, you can tell how your rain garden is functioning. So here is a picture of what a full rain garden looks like during a rain event and then 24 hours later. So it doesn't even look like it rained. Doesn't it work so beautifully? We're not creating ponds. We are creating opportunities for infiltration and having this beautiful vegetation as a part of it. Um, we just had a question about field classes. Um, do we have field classes to learn how to install a professional rain garden correctly? We absolutely have classes on how to install them. Right now, it's paired within our design, our stormwater control measure design and design review class. Um, so that you would learn how to design and install a rain garden through that class and receive a certification for it. But in the future, we're looking to separate out our rain garden class and have a separate certification. So hopefully more to come on that. Um, okay, so with our vegetation and landscaping, um, you might need to replant with native plants or native seed mixes as necessary. Be sure that your vegetation is healthy and also well dispersed. You don't want just um, a, a little a section of your rain garden with healthy plants and the rest of it is dead. You don't want that. You wanna make sure that all of your vegetation is evenly distributed. Once again, it bears repeating, do not use fertilizer or insecticide or herbicide in your rain gardens. You will need to remove your weeds 
um, usually by hand um, or any nuisance vegetation. And that is how you maintain your vegetation. Uh, if you're overflow, you need to make sure that um, your overflow, if it looks like this, or if it looks different, you know, in other ways and other options that I showed you before, that your overflow is working properly, that it's not blocked, that there's no trash or debris there, so that um, in the event that you have water, excess water that needs to go um, somewhere else, that it has, um, the overflow is working correctly. Um, I'm just going to go briefly through the native plant recommendations. I also love native plants and I always want to know um, what are some good ones for rain gardens. Um, more to come from the Colorado Stormwater Center. We are working on ways to, um, to make these installations easier and we'll have um, more examples of rain gardens and the plants that you use in them. But for now, um, here are some uh, resources and opportunities for integrating native plants. There are plant sales. Um, I have worked with the High Plains Environmental Center a lot in Loveland. Um, they have an online sale that started during COVID and has continued. Um, there's a place in Boulder. There's also um, an opportunity in Aurora, but or for Nick's Garden Center in Aurora. But really your local nurseries. Um, asking, I've found success in just calling and asking them if they have a certain native plant that I'm looking for. Um, when you do your designs for your rain gardens, you know, to, um, for your native plantings, just have a couple of different options in case the native plants that you're looking for aren't available um, when you're trying to go plant them. But um, if you're looking for specific ones, just call around to find those specific plants. Local nurseries or nurseries across Colorado are really looking to integrate more native plantings um, in their stock. And so by um, moving in this direction of having more and more rain gardens, that will encourage more nurseries to have more native plants, which is definitely what we want to do. Um, additional resources, the city of Fort Collins actually just um, started this really cool plant finder website. And so if you click on the link here, you can um, uh, have a filter that says native plants. And so you can see pictures and where you should um, put native plants and different uh, what they look like. And um, I have found it a really helpful resource. The Colorado Native Plant Society also has examples in this PDF. Um, and CSU Extension has several different resources as well. We have worked with Dr. Jennifer Busolo um, with CSU Horticulture and Landscape Design for this list. Um, and so what we're kind of talking about now is really more of the, um, of the HOA level or the small commercial level or the residential level. Um, um, uh, rain gardens, when I talk about top tier, mid tier and low tier. So when we have rain gardens that are for uh, water quality, as far as part of your MS4 permit, you want to have a very flat bottom um, so that that you know, sediment can distribute properly. But if you are having a rain garden, a part of like a smaller scale, it's not a part of your MS4 permit, then having it more like a bowl shape. Um, and this is what we're talking about here with top tier, which is needs the least amount of water, mid tier, which is that middle level, and then the bottom tier um, plants, which is the very bottom of your rain garden, which would be largely grasses and, um, and plants that can handle either an inundation of water or no water. Um, and so these are some of the plant suggestions um, that I have really liked. Um, some of my favorite are the hyssop plants. The hummingbirds love these. Um, chocolate flower was also pictured on the very front. Um, and so these are a list of some of my favorites. Um, the grasses here, I really love little blue stem. You can use it on the top tier, the mid tier or the bottom. I actually really like using little blue stem as um, my bottom grass. Here are some shrubs for you. Again, you'll receive all of these slides so you don't need to write everything down. I just wanted to have them in a spot so all of you can see them. Middle tier perennials. Um, I definitely recommend perennials versus annuals so that you, can, you don't have to keep replanting your rain garden year after year. Um, bottom shrubs, and then I go through your perennials and your grasses. Um, so anyway, um, these are all available to you. If you have questions afterwards about specific types of plants, um, you can email me or contact me at any point about those.
Okay, so since rain gardens are so great, why aren't they installed all the time? Like what is stopping us from seeing them everywhere? So there was a um, survey conducted by Wright Water Engineers um, who was looking at largely green infrastructure in general, but it definitely applies to rain gardens. Um, and so one of the concerns was, or one of the barriers that was discussed was lack of successful projects. Um, the inability to see rain gardens in action, you know, um, reluctance to really try something new. We, we know what it takes to install an extended detention basin. We know how the costs of those, we don't really know what the costs are to do rain gardens. Um, how much is it to design it and operate it and maintain it and the whole life cycle, those were pretty uncertain. Um, uncertainty around maintenance, you know, having to take um, new training or learn new techniques on how to maintain these. Um, <clears throat> the codes in municipalities are really for low impact development are really recommended rather than required. Um, and even if you do install a rain garden, you might need to install some other kind of stormwater infrastructure in addition. So these were the concerns that were raised um, during the survey done by Wright Water Engineers. So what do we do? What are some potential solutions? Um, here are a lot of different resources for you on, um, on overcoming some barriers. There's um, the triple bottom line cost benefit analysis. Uh, the Mile High Flood District has been working really hard um, on their chapter four of their urban storm drainage criteria manual. This, the chapter four should be coming out in um, 2022, but the chapter three is available on their website right now. But it has um, really great recommendations for best practices on how to install rain gardens and other types of um, green infrastructure as well. The EPA also has a lot of different resources on um, addressing these concerns and overcoming green infrastructure barriers. What we can also do is integrate into our codes and ordinances um, more opportunities for green infrastructure instead of having it be um, recommended, having it be required, you know, what does it take? How can we encourage more um, people to install green infrastructure or at the very least um, consider it and um, determine if what the best solution is for that um, particular area instead of um, just going with what we know and the usual stormwater control measures. Um, as far as the concern of maintenance and needing new trainings, uh, the Colorado Stormwater Center has several trainings to address this concern. Um, one of them is the inspection and maintenance class, as I mentioned early on, um, how to take care of green infrastructure and also how to design it. And if you are in a municipality and reviewing designs, it's also looking at what do you look for? How do you know if, um, if this rain garden has been designed correctly? How, um, how can you make recommendations on where, um, on additions that could be added to facilitate maintenance? So those classes are there for that. Um, and then the final concern of other types of um, stormwater control measures or drainage infrastructure may still be required, even if you um, use rain gardens or other low impact development. Um, you know, this, these measures can be done um, in connection with each other. It doesn't have to be all one or all the other, um, but by looking at different opportunities to integrate them into our um, land development and finding ways to have more opportunities for rain gardens in our landscapes, um, we're reducing the need to have more um, gray stormwater infrastructure. So let's look at some opportunities. So here you see on the left, a below ground planter as it's listed here, which is a rain garden. Um, or an above ground planter. So if you're looking at ways to increase uh, vegetation in your landscape to reduce the amount of heat island effect that you're having, um, you know, what an opportunity um, to, instead of putting this above ground planter that you will have to irrigate um, continually, not just uh, for two years that will always need irrigation, the water, those raised um, planters also dry out quicker, so you also need more water on those. Um, and so just looking at 
how can even reducing costs from this standpoint, look at how much concrete was used in on the right versus the left. So just really taking into account the cost benefit analysis and looking for ways where we can have more rain gardens installed um, and increase the beauty of our landscapes versus these above ground planters. Okay, I want to um, take a moment here and talk to you about this installation um, and the partnership of the Colorado Stormwater Center and Groundwork Denver. So Groundwork Denver um, has been uh, received a grant to install seven rain gardens in low income areas in Denver, and they contacted us um, to, to learn how to do them. And so um, I had a really great opportunity to go install the first one with them. And I wanted to show and share this with you all so that you can see the steps um, to install them and what that looks like. So here was um, the very beginning of the project. Um, there is a lot of pre-work that needs to be done, of course, with calculating the size, determining um, the correct infiltration of where the rain garden should go, um, selecting the plants, but um, you can still get the idea of how to do an actual installation day of. So this is where the rain garden was going to go. We started construction. Um, there were six of us that day. Um, and this is a smaller rain garden. Um, it was seven feet by five feet. And um, it took us four hours to do this, but you can start to see the rain garden taking shape here. Um, and then once you have the bottom is very, is leveled out, but you can see kind of that bowl shape depression um, kind of forming here. We need to um, lay out all of the plants and make sure that they're not too crowded together. Um, also, just a note on installation, um, since this was done a few weeks ago, at the very end of the summer, the ground was very hard. Um, but if you do your rain garden installations earlier in the year, um, you don't have that issue. Um, but that's just something to note kind of equipment wise what you might need depending on when you install your rain garden. Um, and then here you can kind of you can start to see the progress of um, the downspout extender and then having that erosion control happening because you're getting um, a lot of water coming to that one spot. You want to be sure to have um, that distribution of that water. Um, you can see the rain garden really coming together here with the plants inside of it. Um, we did test it to make sure that um, it was going to work properly, which really allowed us to, um, to make some adjustments um, to where the, the water was flowing and, and see that it went along that and filled up that bottom area first. Um, and this was just a really great um, opportunity to, to partner on this project. Um, and then also the last one is mulch. We took the pictures before the mulch because um, the mulch really is this super absorbent sponge and it's hard to see water moving through mulch. So it's very easy, it's a lot easier to show kind of the movement of that water before the mulch is put on there. But um, mulch is just a very critical component um, of the success of a rain garden. Now here in this picture of this mulch, this is shredded or this is chipped mulch versus shredded mulch. Um, and so I would recommend using um, shredded mulch instead. But for this particular project where cost is, um, is a concern, using sh um, chipped mulch will work as well. And um, what we talked about during this project was if you see that you're having a lot of issues with your mulch moving, then you can ch um, change to shredded mulch. Okay, I'd like to pause here um, for another moment before we go into some great rain garden examples. Again, you can unmute if you would like and ask your question, or you can put it in the chat. And if you think of a question later on, you can always interrupt me. Okay, so I love seeing examples of rain gardens and I hope that after this class you will all contact me and tell me where you saw um, your rain garden. So first, let's just go ahead and get the bad examples out of the way. Um, we have looked at this really bad example of a rain garden several times already on the far left. Um, you can see the number of issues that are happening here. Um, the landscape was um, installed too high. The water 
um, you can see the darker spot on this picture of the, of the far left where the water is pooling and sitting. It's very hard for the water to, um, it doesn't even move all the way through the rain garden. It looks like it's just being stopped because of all of the pollutants in there. So this um, was not maintained correctly. First of all, it wasn't installed correctly. It's not being maintained correctly. It's becoming an eyesore. Um, and this is really giving rain gardens a bad name because it um, is not functioning and it's not, doesn't look nice either. The next one, this in the middle picture is actually a rain garden, if you would believe it or not. Um, so what happened in this situation, <clears throat> I'm gonna try to use a pen here, laser pointer. Okay, so this is the inlet. This is where water comes into the rain garden. But what do we have right here? This is a storm drain. So the water comes into the rain garden and goes immediately down the storm drain. That's why all of these plants are dead is because there's really no water going into them. Um, we do see some possible sediment coming in here. So there might be another inlet um, or, out, or an inlet where water is coming in other ways, but this is not an effective rain garden. This was not um, a rain garden set up for success. The final picture. So this is an example of a four bay um, and an inlet combined. So this, um, let me get my laser pointer once again. <clears throat> so this right here is where the water comes in. This is the four bay that I was telling you about to slow the water down and try to remove the trash and debris um, from entering into the rain garden. But what has happened here is that the entry, the, the holes to go into the rain garden are too small. And so the trash and debris is accumulating here and then it fills up quickly and then the water just overtops this entry point into this rain garden. And you can see it's highly polluted right here. We have erosion happening right here. So this was not a good, um, a good rain garden design um, for success. But this particular, just another note kind of on this four bay, this looks about the size of a shovel. And so that would be a way to maintain it. It is easy to access. So from those standpoints, um, that was a good idea but you also have to look at the overall success of the feature as a whole. And so it has not added to the rain garden. It has really detracted. Okay, so now that we have the bad examples out of the way, let's look at some really cool examples. Um, we've looked at this already, but this is again, looking at um, a rain garden in Fort Collins that's um, in the, on the side of the street um, next to the sidewalk where it's capturing that uh, roadway runoff. Um, and it's this really beautiful feature um, on this street. It's also slowing down um, the cars on this street because you're narrowing the street itself. So it's this form of, um, of controlling speed too. Then this is another picture after a rain event, the same rain garden, um, but it just shows you why maintaining it is important. So during a rain event, um, a lot of debris washed into this rain garden and has clogged the inlet. Um, and so by clogging the inlet, inlet, water cannot get into your rain garden. So you need to note when there's these huge rain events happening and um, be sure to go and maintain your rain garden. One way that would have made this rain garden easier to maintain, and you wouldn't have to go out after every single rain event, is to, in, is to um, install it with a two inch vertical drop. And so you have this drop in your rain garden so that the water will come in to your rain garden and then have to drop down where you'll have some erosion control happening um, to dissipate that water energy. But since it has this drop, um, it won't get clogged. Um, which is happening right here because it doesn't have that drop. Um, so just kind of a note for design, even though the rest of it does look very nice. The third um, example here, that was that distributed inlet that I showed you earlier, um, but just looking at how water is coming in um, of, to this rain garden, this is on, you're getting water from the sidewalk, uh, water is coming in, kind of in a distributed fashion on, from the sidewalk. As you can see on the top of the picture, you're also getting runoff from the, uh, from the street in this distributed format. So an, a lot of water is coming into this particular um, rain garden. It's being utilized as a landscape feature to beautify um, downtown Fort Collins. Um, and it's being utilized, it looks like, as a stormwater control measure as well. You can see the outlet um, actually right here. 
So that's where the overflow is right there. Um, here are some examples from California that I found that I just loved and wanted to share with you all. Um, so this is in, in between a street. This is the street buffer in between um, a parking lot and a street. And they have just really integrated their rain garden into their landscape. You can see how it really adds to the landscape. They have utilized materials that make it look like an integrated part of it instead of this like um, additional feature that doesn't match anything. They've utilized um, native grasses kind of in that middle planting. Um, and they have right here, is where the inlet is. And you can see that they have utilized um, some um, erosion control measures there so that the water isn't undercutting this spot. Um, this is another inlet point. And so for each of these rain gardens, this is this, um, they'll receive water from this side as well as from um, the inlet on this side. Um, on this, on the picture on the right, um, I was actually using this picture in, in another um, presentation and someone said, oh, well, the cat in that picture. And I hadn't even noticed there was a cat in the picture, um, but there it is right there. Um, but in this particular rain garden, they are again utilizing it as this beautiful landscape feature. Um, you can see that there is irrigation up here. Um, and this could be temporary irrigation. It looks like it is since it's on top of the mulch instead of buried within the mulch, um, trying to establish those plants. But just look at the design. You know, there's so many different ways that you can have these beautiful rain garden designs um, that aren't boring, that are really interesting, that are showcasing the beauty of, um, of the plants of our region while performing these really beneficial spaces. I mean, this space Space just looks very calm to me. I would love to have this right next to my house. Um, here is another example um, on the left of um, utilizing uh, parking lot runoff. Um, and so this particular instance, I mean, this, this rain garden is looking like it needs some help. I would have um, off I would have suggested having um, mulch instead of rock because rock is very difficult to clean. You know, we're talking about having to, um, to rake the mulch as the sediment um, starts to accumulate because that's what it's supposed to do. You're supposed to have a uh, sediment accumulate because it's filtering out those pollutants. But with rock, you see it. You see it very easily. It's hard to rake the rock. Um, you know, it's just, it's more difficult to maintain it properly. So I would recommend doing that mulch. Um, but you can still see the basic premise of utilizing a rain garden in this type of strategy. The picture on the right, um, instead of having, again, grass right next to the roadway, um, having this beautiful feature of rain gardens as you're walking along a sidewalk. In Arizona, they have utilized the strategy of these um, basins that fill up from our uh, rain gardens that fill up with the runoff from the road, and then also from the sidewalk, um, different inlets from the different buildings. But then as you can see, there's parking right next to it. And so one of the issues they were encountering is that people didn't want to fall into the basin. You know, if you step out of your car and then falling, you know, into like a sloped side. So what they started doing was creating these little um, stepping pads, you know, stepping um, areas after you get out of your car to not fall into the basin. And so um, really still thinking of solutions to problems rather than saying, okay, well, we can't install a rain garden there because it might be problematic for parking and thinking of these alternate solutions to make them work instead. Um, here is this example again. I just really, really like this picture on the left, um, you know, in this very urban space integrating more, uh, more green area, having these plantings, uh, people are able to walk out, you know, on their lunch break and have um, this beautiful native space to, um, to really feel that, that peace and that connection to nature. Um, but this is a fairly like, relatively small rain garden. Um, and rain gardens do work really well in these smallish settings. Um, but once again, you can really scale them up. So the picture on the right is a very large uh, roundabout rain garden. Um, and it is receiving quite a bit of water from the surrounding impervious area. 
Um, right here in the, let me get my pointer once again, right here, you can see this is the overflow. And that is where um, the water will go if it fills up completely. And this is where the water is coming in. It looks to be a concentrated inlet taking water from, um, from this area above. Um, this example is looking more at um, the rain garden at the, at the mall, um, just to look at it through some different seasons. So I took these pictures in the spring of 2021. It was after a rain. You can see that some sediment has been accumulating um, and that's again what it's supposed to do. But if I had to be critical, you know, if I had to say something that would be a recommendation for this, if you look at the picture on the right, you're getting some ponded water. Um, and so the sediment needs to be removed from um, up in this area right here so that water can just flow freely into the rain garden. What you're getting here is a mosquito breeding area. Um, and so you don't want that to happen. There's um, not enough erosion control was put here. Um, and so that's why you're getting this undercutting of this, um, of this cement right here and causing this pool or ponded water. Ideally, all of the water will flow just directly into your rain garden. So that would be my suggestion um, for them at that particular point. So next, this is summer. Uh, that same spot, summer of 2021, look how beautiful that vegetation is. This was also after a rain event, and so that's why you can see the water here. Um, but it was working very well. You have the multiple inlet points, and so the water is able to distribute through this area. If you didn't know it was a rain garden, nobody would probably would think that it was. They would probably just think that it was a normal landscape feature. Um, here is other views of what that, um, that vegetation looks like. It's very healthy vegetation. To me, this is saying that um, the infiltration rate is working very well. Um, and even though here you see that there's water in it, again, this was after a rain event. So I would expect there to be water um, in the rain garden at that time. Um, but you're starting to see a little bit of sediment coming here, which also means that this water is ponding um, and dropping out the pollutants right there. So once again, there is this drop right here where the water is sitting. And so this is just where that level needs to be raised and you need to put some erosion control. But other than that, this is a really beautiful rain garden. Okay, I know we've had a couple of technical glitches, um, but I'm going to really stretch us today by showing you this uh, website. So I'm going to unshare my screen for a moment and then um, share my, um, my screen to show you this website. Okay, if I can get a thumbs up, from someone, um, can you see my screen? Or just a yes, Lindsay or Darren, maybe Lindsay. Okay, thank you, Lindsay. Um, so this website, again, I'm always trying to find great examples of rain gardens um, so that we can really start integrating them into our, um, our landscape features. So this is an example uh, from Columbine Landscapes. They have a whole section on their website called Rain Gardens, and they are a landscape company in Durango focused on um, really integrating rainwater harvesting. So I'm going to try not to make anyone sick by going through this website, but I just wanted to show you, just bear with me, um, some of these examples from their gallery. Um, again, having these examples to showcase before and after pictures, they're just really powerful. Landscape transformations make a huge impact. Um, and then they have this very cool tool um, and to show you before and after. Um, and so this is just a very neat way to show the impact that rain gardens can have in transforming a space and really adding to the beauty um, and definitely not detracting at all from the landscape, very much an additive feature. So again, you can see here, after, and in Durango, of course, they get less rain than us. This was the, um, the picture that I'm on now is um, showing you how they connect the rain gardens together or the basins together so that when they overflow, they go to the next one. And so you might be thinking, well, that 
looks really like two holes in the ground. You know, what does that look like afterwards? So this is what it looks like afterwards. You can't even tell they're there. And that is the point. Um, the point is to have these different infiltration um, opportunities with the rain garden, but not um, having these just holes in the ground. Um, and so there are really a lot of opportunities to integrate rain gardens into the landscape um, and, and just have them be um, a really beautiful additive part. Um, here is another part that I wanted to show you quickly um, about rain gardens at different parts of the different times of the year. I think this is something else that is just so valuable to show these examples, you know, people having that concern of um, there aren't enough great examples of rain gardens. Well, if we get more pictures, then we can showcase them at different times of the year and really how beautiful they are at all seasons. So spring, summer, fall, that's what it looked like before. Um, okay, so I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, this this um, um, website I have included in the uh, resources at the end, um, but I wanted to try one more thing and I really hope it works, which is sharing um, a brief video, um, which I know will be maybe not a great idea. So um, bear with me and please tell me if you can see this. Elk Grove is a community located just south of Sacramento, California. They've created a rain garden benefiting the community, wildlife, the environment, and- Oh, I do just want to say that this is a very quick four minute video. Um, and I just wanted to showcase how this was, um, this rain garden plaza was really instituted as this community feature. Um, and so I just wanted to show how a community uh, really embraced the idea of a rain garden. So now I'll show you the video. And believe it or not, the ocean, which we'll discuss on this edition of the Thank You Ocean Report. It's a one acre site. In the center is a large plaza. And to one side of the plaza is what looks to be sort of like a wetland with a bridge that meanders across that wetland. And that wetland essentially is the rain gap. The plaza is surrounded by lots of mounds and swales and huge variety of native plants and trees. Paul Newton is Chief of Planning, Design and Construction for the Kazunas Community Services District where the rain garden was developed. He says a rain garden is sort of like creating a mini watershed or wetland habitat and he says there are many benefits to this approach. One of the major benefits would be prevention of stormwater pollution. You basically are keeping the water on the site. So no water is going into the drain system that leads to the creeks and rivers that flow into the ocean. So you're eliminating a lot of stormwater pollution. You're conserving water because you're also reusing some of that water to um, help the plants to grow. The idea of sourcing plant material locally so there's less energy used in transporting plants. And the plants are carefully selected their native plants, but chosen to work best within the various microclimates in the rain garden. The plants provide habitat for insects and birds, and the plants act as a way to filter pollutants. I asked Paul if the rain garden is having a wider impact in his community. Oh yes, most definitely. We have been doing bioswales as a part of our projects for probably five or six years. We've been using native plants, we've been using the subsurface drip irrigation where possible. By putting all of these ideas, if you like, into one garden, we can see how they perform over time and apply them on a larger scale. It's going to be a valuable resource both for us and for developers and other people in the construction industry. The Elk Grove Rain Garden is really a vision for an approach to landscaping, which has evolved in the last half century or so. Greg Gerhardt is Senior Water Resource Control Engineer for the California State Water Resources Board. The way of the 50s and the 60s in the last century was really to build our communities out in a way that moved the water as quickly as possible away from the houses and the property and the other issues that could cause a problem at the local site, just move that water away, get it downstream, and get it into a larger system. But Greg says this fast moving water also carries pollution into the waterways all the way into the ocean. There is a truly dramatic shift going on in the way that planners, engineers, landscape architects, everyone's together on this trying to rethink how we build our urban watersheds so that we mimic natural patterns. And the public is included in this rethinking. 
by the educational opportunity the Elk Grove Rain Guard offers. When they realize that having a rain guard with native plants that attracts bees and hummingbirds and butterflies and another kind of beneficial insects and biota, that starts to integrate their whole concept of what their yard should do and how they want their community to behave. So it really depends on the situation and the person and what they want to do, but there's so many directions you can go when you organize around mimicking natural hydrology. Which is demonstrated in many ways at the Elk Grove Rain Garden. I asked Paul Newton, at the end of the day, how does he feel about the garden? Oh, I feel wonderful about it. It was one of the best projects I think I can remember working on here as a landscape architect. You get to try these things out. They're working. You see people come. It's sort of art, technology, it's education, and then it's fun for the kids all at one time. Both Greg and Paul underscored there are many things we can all do to integrate these low-impact ideas into our cities and gardens. We can use native or drought-tolerant plants, reduce or eliminate the use of pesticides, and install efficient irrigation, such as drip irrigation systems. By the way, the city of Elk Grove's Rain Garden Plaza is the most comprehensive rain garden in the Sacramento region and definitely worth a visit. My thanks to Paul Newton and Greg Gearhart. If you'd like to learn more about this beautiful... Well, thank you all. I hope you enjoyed um, that video. Um, and I hope that it worked out and you're able to all hear it. But I thought that was such a great example of, um, of, of showcasing the abilities, um, sorry, I gotta share that again, of showcasing what that can look like as a part of a community feature and a large scale project. Okay, um, I want to get to tools and resources um, before we end today. Let me just bring my everything back up after moving everything around. Okay. So um, here are some resources if you're really excited now to install uh, rain gardens and get started, which I hope you all are. Um, and so one of the things that you can do, Classic is a tool um, from the One Water Solutions Institute where the Stormwater Center, uh, the Colorado Stormwater Center is a part of. And this tool really enables you to utilize different scenarios. It's a GIS tool. Um, and to really evaluate what is the best type of stormwater control feature for your space. Taking into account the life cycle costs um, and water quality as well. And so um, this tool you can find um, through our website. If you're looking for ways to figure out, okay, how much will it cost for me to do rain gardens in my area? Um, here are a couple of different tools, the green value calculator, if you're looking for a general area um, or a general um, concept, it gives you some different options to choose from. If you select um, this tool at the bottom, the launch tool button, um, then it takes you, I believe, to here where you can then um, make some of your own inputs. And then the Mile High Flood District has this really neat tool. If you navigate to this website and then select BMP sizing at the bottom of the page, um, then it takes you to, um, it downloads a PDF as well as a um, Excel spreadsheet where you can actually put in um, and it will give you costs, uh, Colorado focused costs. So it helps you to really get a better idea um, with what those costs might look like. The uh, Tap into Resilience Toolkit has a lot of different ways that um, and worksheets that you can work from on why should you integrate um, resilience or why you should integrate green infrastructure into your um, strategic planning. Um, and then the Growing Water Smart Program with the Sonoran Institute, like Lindsay mentioned earlier, this is a really great opportunity to, to break down silos, to get people to talk to one another within municipalities um, about how can we um, better integrate our stormwater with our water conservation? How can we look to reduce the amount of drinking water that we're utilizing on our landscapes? It really gets people in the same room to talk to one another. Their next session for Colorado will be in 2022. Um, once again, the Urban Storm Drainage Criteria Manual has um, some really great recommendations and then their chapter four, I think is just going to be fantastic. Um, and so I highly encourage you to look for that. 
Everybody wants to know about funding resources, of course. Um, the uh, Northern Water has their grant opportunities. Um, but in addition to that, there's a couple with City of Fort Collins. I know that you're not all with City of Fort Collins, but just wanted to give you some different um, examples of ways that you could do some of this funding. The Nature and the City Implementation Grants, um, you can apply for right now by October 20th. Um, the City of Fort Collins also has the ZIP program for HOAs and commercial areas or a residential ZIP program as well. And so there are grants available or rebates available through there. Some additional funding opportunities if you're a nonprofit or governmental agency is the Colorado Garden Foundation, um, Great Outdoors Colorado potentially. Um, you can do local turf removal rebates, and then the City of Greeley Life After Lawn Program is another example of ways that you can reduce the amount of lawn you have and potentially get a rebate for that. Um, one of the ways that we can have, um, you know, and really incentivize these programs is to potentially have as a municipality an expedited review process, you know, cost sharing grants for proposals um, that integrate rain gardens or green infrastructure strategies, having um, a reduction in the stormwater fee um, for properties or programs that are uh, looking to integrate these strategies, and then recognizing people who are doing great work. Um, I do see a question here um, about, do I know any landscape companies in the Denver metro area that are similar to Columbine, Columbine Landscapes? I'm really impressed with their website. I love their website too. Um, I'm glad that you enjoyed that. In the Denver metro area, I have not found a landscape company um, that is similar to Columbine Landscapes, but that of course does not mean that it doesn't exist. Um, and so I will keep looking, but they are the ones that I have found um, to be, you know, really, really trying to integrate rainwater harvesting into their um, strategies. Um, another question here was, we've added rain gardens into one of our design projects. We would like someone um, to review the rain garden design to make sure they design it properly. Can you success, suggest someone having experience that can help us with that review? Um, thank you for your question. I can make some suggestions for you. Um, and so we can talk more um, offline about that, but it depends what type of project it is. If you have a project that is not um, for water quality, not considered a stormwater control measure feature, um, then there are some different options versus you'll need to go with an engineer if it is considered um, for your stormwater control measure. Um, here is my contact information. If you have any other questions afterwards, um, please uh, reach out to me. And then I love resources. So I have um, included here for you a lot of different um, resources um, to learn more about green infrastructure in general, all of the cost analysis tools, funding opportunities, um, ways to integrate uh, water into land use planning, um, you know, moving forward. There is the video for my residential rain garden design class. Um, I will also in kind of a, a thank you email, I will also have the PowerPoint to that. Um, and then there are a lot of different examples. If you're looking for examples on, you know, what have other cities done? What are other um, really cool projects happening, like the video that I showed you? Um, the Western Resource Advocate um, Guidebook has a lot of them, and then the Sonoran Institute also has some really great examples. Um, the One Water Solutions Institute has the classic tool that I mentioned, and that's there at the bottom. Um, we're always working on making it easier to make decisions um, to really save water and utilize stormwater, and so we are um, in the process of creating more and more um, tools for that. So definitely look um, to our website for um, additional options. And then there's a couple of more um, questions here. Oh, thank you to Lindsay for including the next um, stormwater training that we have for extended detention basins. Um, and that is there in the link. We would love to have you all um, visit us at that one as well. Um, and then this is, uh, that was, that was it. Thank you so much. I will um, stay here for any remaining questions that you might have. Um, feel free to again, unmute or ask them in the chat.
Um, but before people go, I just would also like to thank everyone for joining us today. This is such an important um, opportunity um, to integrate rain gardens and to really be utilizing stormwater as a resource. Um, I thank you for your interest in that. Um, and I look forward to working with you kind of moving forward and making sure that we have beautiful landscapes and protect our water resources for the future. It's always fantastic to partner with uh, Northern Water. I'd like to thank them um, for their commitment to water conservation um, and to um, also utilizing stormwater beneficially. Um, I would like to open it back up to Northern Water if they would like to make any closing remarks as we're waiting for questions. Um, thank you so much, Linda, for your comment. Um, Frank or Lindsay, would you like um, to make any final um, comments for the day? Hi, this is Frank. I'll just say for attending everyone and thank you, uh, Jessica, for an excellent presentation today. We look forward to the next one and we encourage all of you to take these on and give us a shout and let us know how they work for you if you have a nice project to uh, implement. That's all I've got. Thank you, Frank. Um, and then kind of the last the last piece here is that this will be recorded. So if you have um, someone who would benefit um, watching this video, um, please stay tuned. We will notify everyone when the PowerPoint presentations and the videos in English and Spanish are available on our websites. Um, once again, thank you all very much. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. We look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thank you. Ruth or um, Long, do you have any questions that I can answer for you before we leave? Well, thank you once again for attending. So Jessica, this is Long. Hi. Hi. So um, yes, so I mentioned that we have a uh, reconstruction project that we widening out a roadway from two lanes to uh, four lanes plus diesel lanes. So uh, our uh, environmental person, they actually would like to add in a feature like rain garden into the project. Um, part of it, it is to address the, the, uh, the storm water on our project. And, and then and then this is basically it's a new um, implementation to the county. Mm -hmm. So we want to put in, but we have the consultant designing it. But I'm a project manager and I look at it and say, okay, there's some plants and there's some pipes and there's some gravel. That's look <laughs> that yeah. looks okay. But I, I don't have the experience to to say yes or no or no that 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 one few things that you mentioned to me that 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 caught my attention that snow plow uh snow storage it th those these got rain gardens right next to the curb and i'm i need to go back and take a look at it if if our maintenance um force if they plow the snow will that potential push the snow over the curb and then land it into this um you know rain garden so i don't know if it's effective um to put it that close to the curb so that's something i need to uh, look into um but like i said the, the design of the rain car i have no clue i mean the consultant submitted to me um i just look at it and say okay well that's look good maybe i need to circle back to them and say well who 
did you have somebody that have experience to design this mm -hmm. or a typical engineer just came up with some landscaping plants and then uh, um, and then overflow or, or, or what I, I guess maybe that's the question I need to ask them and and I would recommend you know the design design review class that we have really goes through how to look at the design the designs that you that are submitted to you um, and to to make sure that they are being designed for success. I mean, um, it's asking the questions, like how do you maintain it? Where is the under drain outlet? What kind of filter material have you used? Um, how did you calculate, you know, the, the size of the rain garden? Um, where will the overflow be? Um, and are you doing a full infiltration, partial infiltration, no infiltration? How is that determined? Um, how is your plant selection going to be? Um, taking into account the road salt that is coming off of the road right there. Um, so I can try to find someone um, to connect you with. So I have a couple of ideas. I just don't know if they typically consult um, on these cases. So I have your email. And um, do you know, do you know Holly Pisa with Mile High Flood District? I don't. I know Dan Hill and uh, Brooke. Okay. Over my high district, but I don't know. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to contact Holly and see if she has a recommendation um, for how to help you. Um, also, the um, Urban Storm Drainage Criteria Manual. I mean, that has step by step um, how to install a rain garden and what um, features have to be in there. You know, for your water quality. Um, and so, definitely connecting to that resource right away. But then I will also um, work with Holly and see if I can get you. Um, some more definite information on that. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Thank you so much for attending. Yeah, no, thank you very much. That was great. Uh, very educational. <laughs> oh, open my eye and say, wow, that's a lot more to rain garden, not just uh, <laughs> put some plants on the ground and then I put some, and then some devices to feed water into the rain garden. <laughs> so, so thank right. you. You're yeah. welcome. <laughs> yes, they, you know, um, they are really, really neat features um, and they can be applied a lot of ways. So I'm glad that you found that helpful and useful. And then I'll be connecting with you soon. Okay, thanks. All right, yeah, thank you. Fantastic day. Bye. Okay, bye bye. Uh, Ruth, do you have a question? Okay. Um, well, I know. I know Ruth, um, and so it's okay if she hears the rest of this. Um, and so I just wanted to check in with everyone. I'm going to um, stop recording. I think that all the recordings went well. Um, hopefully, let me see here.